Hello to all the young activists, students, and leaders across the globe. My name is Sahara Mohammed Zeta, and I'm a 20-year-old young explorer at the National Geographic Society and a student at Harvard. Welcome to our seventh and sadly our final session of Gen Geo Careers and Exploration, which is part of our summer learning series brought to you by young people for young people. Now, this series emphasizes National Geographic's belief that we, Gen Geo, are the key to addressing some of the world's most pressing problems. As members of the Gen Geo community, we're a group of global young people who are thinking critically, we're collaborating globally, and becoming informed leaders, decision makers, and best of all, champions for our planet. We're focused on how we can support young people and foster movements, organizations, and inventions that are currently being driven. Because at the Society, we believe that the power of science and exploration and education and storytelling are ultimately going to illuminate and protect the wonders of our world. So right now, I think we're at a quite pivotal moment uh, where passionate young people are really leading the efforts across the globe to advance science, to advance communities in ways that's going to fundamentally shape our future. But the real question still is, is how can you convert that passion into a sustainable and fulfilling career. So to help you continue on your journey to change the world, I'll be sharing a lot of behind the scenes looks at some of the inspiring careers and individuals who bring National Geographic's mission truly to life. So no matter where you are in your career, where you are in your studies, your educational journey, you're gonna have the chance to learn firsthand from National Geographic's very own experts. So far in the series, we've learned from explorers from all over the world, including the Philippines, the US, Brazil, Bangladesh, and Norway. And we've engaged with audiences from India and Venezuela and Mexico and Honduras. It appears though, that we have left no continent unexplored, that we have left no environment unexamined. But this week, Heather Lynch would beg to disagree. Um, there's still one very formidable ecosystem and career that we have yet to explore. So Heather is a quantitative ecologist whose research is dedicated to understanding the population dynamics of Antarctic wildlife with a particular focus on Antarctic penguins. She has over a decade of field experience in Antarctica and has helped pioneer the use of satellite imagery for studying the distribution and abundance of Antarctic seabirds. Heather has also studied at Princeton and Harvard, and she's currently a professor at Stony Brook University. She serves as the principal investigator for a large multi-institution National Science Foundation, award tasked with building cyber infrastructure required to deny high resolution commercial imagery and high performance computing for imagery enabled science in the polar regions. So you wanna make sure to stay tuned to the very end to hear about Heather's story, learn about her experiences, ask live questions and listen to some incredible ways that you can get involved from her work right from home. So welcome to the series, Heather. It's such a pleasure to have you on. I think you're still muted. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the scourge of our age. Thank you so much. I'm really appreciating the opportunity. Oh, absolutely, Heather, before we start, I mean, I have to ask you, you were a former student at Harvard, and through my own personal experiences on campus, Boston's cold winters are not what I would call exactly pleasant. You know, most people, including myself, can barely tolerate the cold. But you've seemed to not only find, but become an expert in the only place on the planet that I could only imagine is colder than Boston. So I'd love to start off the conversation by learning a little bit more about your story, how you ended up working in Antarctica, and what you're currently doing. Oh, you know what's funny is the first time I ever went to Antarctica, I left from Boston. I was still a PhD student just finishing up at Harvard and it was actually warmer on the Antarctic Peninsula than it was in Boston. So it, it's more pleasant than a Boston winter, but um, it can get pretty gnarly down there. And I'm just super excited to, to share with you a little bit about my own science and sort of my journey. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you guys some, some slides. And so, you know, I just like to start out by highlighting, you know, that my work is united by a really simple question, which is just how many penguins are there in Antarctica and how in the world are we ever going to figure that out? 
Um, but before I, I get there, uh, I would like to take a chance to talk a little bit about the journey uh, because it's been a very indirect road to what it is I do now. And for those students out there who aren't entirely sure as to what they wanna do with their life, um, I think that uh, this highlights that there are many roads to, uh, to Antarctica. Um, you know, so I started out, I went to a science and technology high school and I, I loved organic chemistry. You know, I wanted to study organic chemistry and I ended up going to Princeton for chemical engineering. Uh, but as soon as I, I got to Princeton, I loved chemical engineering, but I really fell in love with physics. And I ended up getting an undergraduate degree in physics and I went to graduate school for physics. And I spent, you know, three years studying electrons at near zero temperatures. And I liked that work, but I also liked the outdoors. And I felt that there were some really pressing environmental problems that I wanted to, uh, to study and to help solve. And so I ended up transferring in graduate school all the way from physics to biology. And I combined my mathematical background with my interest in the environment to study what's called quantitative ecology, which is, you know, the study of ecology, but approached from a mathematical angle. And so I got my PhD in biology and I ended up studying uh, insect outbreaks of all things. And it turns out that insect outbreaks, mountain pine beetles, uh, in fact, change the color of the trees that they attack, the trees become red. And we can see that from satellite imagery. So I got really good at looking at satellite imagery. And as you'll see, that ended up being really important for the work that I do now. Uh, but it certainly was, you know, it was a very indirect journey. And I continue to evolve as I'll talk a little bit about. So, you know, I just want to start by saying that you know, there's probably no better starting point for understanding what's going on in Antarctica, particularly in the area that I focus on, the Antarctic Peninsula, than this really um, terrific piece from November of 2019 in last year's National Geographic, uh, which really focused on how the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the most rapidly warming areas on the entire planet. And these uh, changes in the climate are having real impacts on the animals that live down there. My own research program is at its heart one of just counting. We want to go down to the Antarctic uh, every year and count all of the penguins and seals and, and whales, but primarily the penguins, and figure out how many penguins are there in Antarctica and how are their populations changing over time. And this work is extremely low tech. We literally count them. Like people think that we do something more sophisticated. Like we, we count them one by one, we write that down and we count some more. Um, so in that sense, it's not, um, it's not hard in that sense, but as you can see here, there are some real physical challenges to surveying some of these uh, penguins. They live in steep and remote areas that are very physically challenging to get into. Uh, there are certainly some, some hazards. So here you can see me being attacked by a skua as I'm trying to count these gentoo penguins down below. And here I am uh, being attacked by a skua, but there are other challenges. So we have to worry about crevasses and, uh, you know, waves and, and sea ice and all of the other uh, difficulties of working uh, in Antarctica. So the work is intellectually interesting, um, but, but it's also can be dangerous. And so we have to um, sort of think very carefully about how to do this safely. But the real challenge is that a lot of these penguin populations are enormous. And they're far too big for us to count. I mean, just look at this colony here. There's probably upwards of a million penguins at this colony. There's no way that we can just count one by one all of the penguins that are here. Uh, and if you look really closely, you can actually see that there's two different kinds of penguins in the foreground here. So um, that makes the challenge even more difficult. And so we have to develop alternative ways of counting penguins, which at its face seems like a really simple problem. And one way we do that is we actually use the penguin poop that's on the landscape, what we call guano. And that penguin guano, because penguins are primarily eating krill, which is kind of like a pink shrimp-like creature, they leave these pinkish stains on the landscape that we can actually see from satellites. And as you can see from the little diagram here, the physics of penguin poop being what it is, uh, it doesn't actually get very far from the nest itself. And so we can use the area of that stain and work backwards to figure out how many penguins do we think are nesting inside of the colony. And this has a lot of similarity to what I had been doing uh, with my PhD work. So, you know, as I kind of talked about this very indirect journey to what it is I do now, as a PhD student, I was using satellite imagery to find 
beetles, which are too small to be seen directly, but by the impact they have on the landscape. And so now I use the very same tools to find penguins through the impact that they have on the landscape. And you can see that, that guano stain, and that's what we're using to survey them. So we can do this to not only get population estimates at the really largest colonies, but also to survey colonies that we could never get to, that are like too remote and never explored, and that otherwise we would know nothing about. So one of our you know, biggest discoveries that I'd like to share with all of you is this area called the Danger Islands. So here in yellow, uh, just color coded in uh, the guano as we saw it from satellite imagery. And this most northern colony here called Harawina Island was known to have a large number of Adelie penguins. But all of these other islands to the south were not known to contain penguins. And yet we discovered all of this guano and satellite imagery that suggested that these were some of the largest Adelie penguin colonies in the entire world. And we didn't know anything about them. So when we discovered them in satellite imagery, uh, we went ahead, as I'll show you in a second, uh, organized an expedition to the region. But all in all, satellite imagery has discovered over a million penguins uh, that were not known to exist before. And so that's, you know, maybe five or 10% of the global population of these Antarctic penguins uh, that have been discovered just in the last decade from satellite imagery. What was remarkable about the, the danger islands is that this area was considered of low priority for protection and yet was um, very close to some other areas that uh, were considered for protection in a marine protected area. And since we discovered that the Adelie penguins, um, they're actually more Adelie penguins in this little tiny chain of islands than in the entire rest of the Antarctic Peninsula combined, the proposed marine protected area has been expanded by something like 2 million hectares to accommodate this Adelie penguin hotspot. So it's a really nice example of how some of the technology that we've developed has actually had real conservation implications. So we did launch a big expedition to the Danger Islands, and I'm just going to play this little video here. On the right, you'll see some drone uh, video of one of these big Adelie penguin colonies that we, uh, that we surveyed. And you can see this is one of the largest Adelie penguin colonies in the world. So each of those little black dots is an Adelie penguin nest and you can see that there are hundreds of thousands of these nests on this particular island. And this drone imagery that we collect when we're actually in the field allows us to do something more than just count. It allows us to develop these three-dimensional models of these islands. And you can see part of that model here in the lower left. And those three-dimensional models allow us to understand how water flow and hydrology and geology and the biology all tie together to determine where the penguins are nesting and which areas are unsuitable for penguin nesting. And you can see that these are the very groups of penguin nests that we can see uh, at much lower resolution in satellite imagery. So I just have this little video that uh, kind of zooms into the danger islands and it shows you how we go from trying to understand penguins at this sort of big continental scale and yet we can use satellites to zoom into these island chains like this one here in the danger islands. And satellites allow us to get so far, but then we can use drone imagery to get even closer and to get even better resolution imagery. And here you can see each individual little penguin nest and we can get even finer and finer resolution imagery. And eventually, of course, we wanna combine that with the work that we do in the field. And so the work that we do in the field allows us to connect all that information on how many penguins there are, but to how are their chicks doing, how many chicks are surviving, what are they eating, behavior, all of those other things that we might want to know about Antarctic penguins. We're also doing a lot of genetic work now. So this is me on the right and my student Rachel Herman on the left. And so part of uh, her PhD work is understanding how these penguins are moving, particularly the Gentoo penguin here that we're, we're sampling. And so we can combine this kind of computer satellite work with the, the field work and some of the, the more hands-on genetics work. So, you know, for a conservation biologist, you know, it was, it was, you know, the highlight of my career when National Geographic emailed me as they were putting together this November 2019 issue uh, asking, you know, how many penguins are there in Antarctica and how have their populations changed over time? 
And that's something that I actually know the answer to. We know the answer now because of what we've been able to do both in the field and using satellites. And you can see that you know, it's a mixed picture. So the Adelie penguin populations have declined sharply over the last 40 years, but the Gentoo penguin, the one that we were taking blood samples from, their populations have skyrocketed. And so why that is that some species are doing poorly and some are doing really well is something that we'd like to know better. So, you know, I just wanna um, say that this has been really high profile work, which has been um, exciting in a way, but certainly the issues that we get into in terms of, you know, what is the role of climate change? What is the role of fishing? Um, that certainly draws the public's attention and everybody loves penguins. Uh, some of the recent work that we did highlighted a nearly 50%, actually over 50% loss of chinstrap penguins on a very famous island called Elephant Island. And that was covered by everything from National Geographic to Al Jazeera and even People Magazine. Um, but in that work that we do with media, which is actually a huge part of my job now, requires all sorts of new skills. So how, you know, working with TV and film crews and young adult authors and print media in the field, back here in the office, um, and sharing what it is that we do is uh, actually a really big part of my job now and one that I really enjoy. A lot of the work that I do is specifically for kids and I'm always excited when the work that we do uh, can be used for educational materials like this one here on the Danger Islands um, in A to Z readers. And so I love the opportunity to use this as a platform to talk to kids about satellites and biology and climate change because there's some really interesting, um, we can use penguins as a vehicle to talk about a lot of different interesting issues. And so finally, I was kind of asked to, uh, you know, if I had any advice for young scientists or, or young, young uh, geographers, and uh, I kind of boiled it down to these three things. So I'll mention them briefly now, and we can talk about it uh, later, and maybe you guys will have some questions. Um, but the first piece of advice was, you know, is really to play the long game. Like your career is, is long, and so, you know, when there are setbacks, when, you know, expeditions um, don't work or, you know, something isn't funded or you don't get into the college that you want or whatever it is, um, you have to think, you know, is this going to be important in 10 years, in 20 years? So it's really about having a career uh, that is successful and headed in the right direction and not getting bogged down, you know, in, in what end up being fairly minor setbacks along the way. And the second is to have what's called a, a growth mindset. So I, um, to, to quote from, I'm showing my age here, but there's a very old sort of home exercise video series called P90X. And uh, in that, the Tony Horton, the, the trainer says, you know, you know, don't say I can't, say I currently struggle with. And so this is a really big one for me. Um, you know, there are gonna be things that you're not uh, good at or not within your realm of expertise in that moment, but five, 10, 20 years from now, you could be world's expert. You know, so it's just a matter of deciding that that's something that you're going to pursue, um, but nothing is out, you know, nothing's out of uh, possibility. Everything's possible. And finally, what I call kind of extreme agency, you know, by which I say um, that if there's something that you want that you, you, you kind of have to just go for it. And so I find that a lot of young people in particular are kind of waiting for that invitation or they're waiting to be given permission or they're waiting to be invited along. And so what you have to do is just sort of take your own career, your own studies, you know, the bull by the horn as it were, and just, just do it. Like, you know, don't ask for permission. Just like, just, you have to sort of plow ahead with this like relentless, you know, commitment and, and you can make it happen. Um, but uh, um, you can't kind of wait for someone else to take the first step. And so with that, you know, I'll, I'll take any questions you guys might have. We can continue uh, the conversation. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what, what it is I do with penguins. Oh, Heather, thank you so, so much. Frankly, I'm just blown away by the work that you're doing to understand such incredible environments, but especially by the way that you're consistently like incorporating new technology and scientific methods and unconventional ideas into your practice. And we have 
tons of questions, don't you, Ari? Right. Awesome. Our YouTube live setup here is not as high tech as the tools used in your research, but we do <laughs> have this fun little chat feature. So to all my audience members on live, I want to make sure that we're including you in our conversations as well. So please share your thoughts by tagging at NatGeoEducation or using hashtag GenGeo on Twitter, on Instagram, or even on Facebook. And be sure to submit any questions you have for us through the chat bar so that Heather and I can address them. So Heather, let's hop right in. I mean, you have found your niche working in a very focused and specific region of the world. And to start the conversation, I just like to take you know, a few steps back and start at the very, very beginning. You know, what was your personal journey that led you to this work? And would you mind telling us a little bit more about how you developed your passion for ecology and why you wake up every day excited to count penguins? Sure, no, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've always loved science. And so, you know, it could, I, I literally, when I, when I was first growing up, I wanted to be a forensic pathologist. I wanted to then be an airplane crash investigator. And then I wanted to be a, a chemist. Um, there's no area of science that I haven't wanted to work in at some point. And I feel like I just keep meandering through them. So I've kind of, now I'm, I'm sort of edging towards computer science and who knows, you check back in a decade, I'll be doing something else entirely. But, um, but I had this sort of period when I was thinking about leaving physics and, and, and going to, to do something more environmentally focused. And I went to the seminar by the oceanographer and, and conservation marine biologist, Jeremy Jackson. He went to Harvard and he gave this seminar at like this really critical time for me. Um, and I remember like I went by myself, like everyone, all my friends were physicists. They, they were like, why are you going to this talk on, on the ocean? You know, and, and I'm kind of exaggerating, but like my take home memory of that seminar um, was like that every animal that Jeremy Jackson had ever studied had gone extinct and like the oceans are gonna be full of jellyfish. Like it, it probably wasn't that severe, but like that's my memory of it was that there was just this tragedy that was sort of unfolding and, and it truly is, um, but I just felt this call to urgency. And so that for me just sort of like, you know, it was the, 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 that tipped me sort of over to like, all right, I, I'm literally gonna walk away from everything that I've done before and start fresh and I had no background in biology. I literally had to start from scratch taking undergraduate classes with students that were 10 years my junior, um, but it was, it was worth it. And I have found this area of the planet that I felt, um, yeah, where my skills uh, in sort of computers and math and, and this kind of detailed accounting of literally like, okay, are there 27 penguins on that island or 26? Like I'll spend like a whole day obsessing about 27 versus 26. Um, and uh, that kind of detailed work, I think, has has turned out to be really important as we try and track these populations through time. So I would never have guessed that I study penguins now, but it actually has ended up being sort of a perfect fit for my very detail oriented, uh, you know, predilections. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and I think my next question kind of follow up with your journey is, you know, 10 years ago, did you at all anticipate to be where you are right now? And how you know, do young people that are at a crossroads in their life reconcile with a little bit of ambiguity? Oh, no, in, in no way did I, I expect to be where I am now, in part because actually I didn't see myself going into academia, like becoming a professor. I was pretty certain that I didn't want to become a professor, um, that there were, and there remain to this day, some amazing opportunities in industry and NGOs. And, and a lot of my students will... Um, pursue these other opportunities. So, um, but what I what I love about what I do now is that ability to work with students. I love teaching. I love mentoring graduate students. I have uh, a large research lab. Um, it has been the hardest part for me, um, and, and in many ways, I'm lucky. But it's of this coronavirus situation is that um, you know the science is fun, but what gets me up every morning are the the scientists and the people and the students and getting to like work with other people and just be amazed at their ideas and their creativity and not being able to do that in, in the same way has kind of reminded me why I do what I do, you know, because I, I like the, it surprised me how much I, I enjoy the, the people aspect of what I do um, as opposed to just the, the science of it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to things getting back to normal and for us to all get back in the lab. 
Oh, hopefully. I mean, and Heather, to me, this seems like such a technical occupation. You know, you need a few skills, not only but to understand, but to rigorously measure and then study the ecosystems that you're studying right now. And then on top of that, you have to find a way to convey these incredibly complex methods to a wider audience. So, um, you know, what role did your education specifically have in harnessing some of these technical skills? Oh yeah, so it ended up being, you know, absolutely critical that I come with all of these disparate skills. And in fact, my lab, like I'm, I'm a professor of ecology and evolution, but in my research lab, I have students from applied math and statistics, from marine sciences, ecology, uh, electrical and computer engineering, uh, computer science. So, you know, I, I think that I've been able to put together a team which kind of uh, manifest all of this diversity that we need computer scientists talking to a, a bird expert talking to a marine conservation biologist and so that's kind of the fun part, part for me I think of myself as like a baseball manager you know like I need a first baseman and a second baseman like putting together these teams that really work together to solve these really highly technical problems um, and I I I think that I have the confidence to, to kind of cross the aisle that way because I I have studied so many other other things um, but that is um, that is some of the fun parts for me is realizing that like, okay, to, I need right now, and you know, a computer scientist and we need to develop the software and we're getting very into machine learning. And, um, you know, the, the problem is, is, is quite straightforward. Like why, why are the penguin populations changing in Antarctica? Um, but the tools that we throw at that are, um, very by the day. And so we're, we're like, you know, MacGyver, just doing everything we can to kind of solve this problem and, and, and piece it all together. And so it, um, you know, what we're doing this year is going to look very different from what we're doing next year to solve the same problem. And, and on the flip side, you know, is there anything that you learn that only comes from experience in the field that really can't be taught in the classroom? Yes. So that really comes down to the, to the fieldwork part. So that's why, you know, I think of someone's first year in Antarctica as being just a training opportunity like it no one's going to get any of their own science done and so we do what I call sort of family style science like we have a set of science goals we're all working together as a team um, but it takes so long to learn we have hundreds of sites that we're monitoring like you have to know all right we're at this island and you just have to know okay there's 40 chin strap penguins that are around the ridge and like you don't know they're there in, unless you've been there before but um just to gain that kind of on the ground experience and to keep your eyes open and your ears open. You're never going to learn it from a book. There are no books that tell you where the penguins are in Antarctica. And so it's just a matter of spending a lot of time down there. And that's where, um, you know, uh, I think that that experience is, is key. And in terms of field research in general, there is no uh, alternative to just being there in the field long hours, long stretches, you just have to kind of put in the hours. And I think that's true probably everywhere in the world. Yeah, but I think those long hours are worth it in the end, especially when you see a lot of the impact, you know, um, you know, has your work helped others in the community or even policymakers understand peng penguin populations, why they're rising, why they might be falling or changing so dramatically? You know, at the end of the day, you know, what impact have you seen this work have when it comes to creating tangible and meaningful change? Sure, everything we do in the lab, like literally everything we do is geared towards answering a question that somebody has. So we work so closely with the, with the tour operators, with the, um, the Antarctic Treaty parties, you know, developing site guidelines, really detailed stuff like, oh, here's an island. Uh, how many passengers, you know, do you think could safely disembark on this side of the island and how close will they be to the colony? And, um, all the way down to trying to decide, you know, how many portable toilets you might need on an island if people are, are camping on that island, you know, every aspect of sustainable tourism we're involved with. And so we developed with some NASA funding, uh, quite a bit of NASA funding over a long period of time, what's called the mapping application for penguin populations and projected dynamics. So it's mapped with an extra P in there. Uh, but it's at penguinmap.com. And so this we designed as like a one-stop shop for information on penguin populations and dynamics. And so anybody can go and get literally up to the minute information on how many penguins there are at all of the nearly thousand penguin colonies in Antarctica, how their populations have changed, how their populations are forecast to change, 
Uh, and that's something that, that we use for science, that the policymakers use, that, that kids at home can look at. And we have this nice feature there, which is called uh, be a penguin detective. And so we have citizen scientists at home, kids, adults, seniors, all of the above that are helping us look through Google Earth imagery because we continue to find new penguin colonies that we didn't know were there. I'm sure there are more undiscovered colonies out there to, to, to be found. And so we have some um, training tips like tools on what to look for. And um, so it's kind of a nice feature if people are interested in helping us find new penguin colonies because we really do have people email us with new discoveries all the time. Oh, that is so exciting. Um, and you mentioned a little bit of the funding along the way. And I often say that your dream job is finding something you absolutely adore to do and then figuring out a way to get paid to follow that passion. So while your mission is resonating with me and a lot of people, Heather, I think it's quite another obstacle to turn that passion into a career like you did. So what steps did you take to transform this ecology into a professional and funded endeavor, not just by NASA, but also by Nat Geo? Sure. Well, I think that that for me is one of the real advantages of being a professor. And I think, um, you know, being a professor has other challenges. But what's nice is that, um, you know, I get paid in some sense to to teach and to do research, but I get paid um, whether or not, you know, I get that particular grant or that particular award, you know, so it allows me as a researcher to pursue my passions and in a sense get paid to teach. Um, and then the research money that we get allows us to do all the really great stuff in the field. So we, our own work is funded by a mix of uh, National Science Foundation and NASA and National Geographic and, and NGOs. And so we've had to, to piece it together and it's a constant struggle, but it's nice that my own salary in a sense is not um, dependent on that grant money and that we can focus on using that grant money to pay students and uh, equipment and plane tickets. And I think for me that has um, that's been a nice way to go. It's not the only way by any means, but um, it's nice to know that I can continue to do this year in, year out, um, even if it's just me and, and my computer sort of pursuing my own odd obsession with how many penguins there are on the planet. Oh, I, I love to hear it. Um, and, and you mentioned this briefly, but you know, you're not just an ecologist, you're also an educator. Did you ever anticipate being both? And what is that intersection like? Sure. I mean, I come from a long line of teachers, so I think I'm probably following in the in the family tradition of being an educator. Um, but I love teaching, and I teach. In, in my case, I only teach statistics courses. So most people wouldn't think that I'm an ecologist, but my specialty is in modeling, and I love bringing those tools to other students. They might be studying coral reefs or lemurs or whatever, um, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have a bunch of data and you wanna make sense of that data. And so I help students do that. And I uh, teach graduate students primarily, and it's wonderful to see how they use all of those skills in their own research. Um, so I think that my teaching definitely helps the research and my research is constantly informing the teaching. And for me, I, I love that, um, uh, that complementarity, I guess, of being a professor at a university. No, it's very neat to hear. And, and, and I'm just personally curious about our audiences as well as from your perspective, what have you found to be you know, attributes of successful students, whether that be on the field and ecology and statistics? You know, what's something that a lot of the great students that you've interacted with all have in common? So I think that the most important trait is that they're good writers. So we don't think of writing as being you know, essential to science, but at the end of the day, if you cannot communicate your ideas, be it writing for public audiences or in a scientific manuscript or writing an, an essay, or even just writing a decent email, I think that being able to write well is something that students undervalue when they have that skill. They don't appreciate what a, what a value it is. And I think they don't always work hard enough to to develop, to flex those muscles. So they tend to think about developing other skills and leave the writing aside. So I would definitely encourage people to, to, to really hone the craft of writing. And I think that that will serve them well in college, regardless of what they study. I know what courses I'm signing up now for the fall semester. So thank you for that. <laughs> and speaking of communicating your ideas, okay, you're a scientist, you're an educator, a pioneer. 
but now also kind of a media personality. You know, why do you think it's so important to communicate these results to wider audiences? You had some pictures in your PowerPoint that illustrated your interaction <laughs> with media and with communication skills. Why is it not something to be overlooked when you're crafting your narrative? Well, you know, at the end of the day, there are only maybe a couple thousand scientists in Antarctica, which means for the other 9 billion, you know, 7.8 billion people on the planet, you're going to have to reach people in some other way. And, you know, nobody is going to read a lengthy scientific journal article like, like my three collaborators will read that, um, but that's not where the biggest impact will be. And so just talking with audiences, working with media, I work with media across the whole gamut. So I do a lot of support for organizations that are planning Antarctic uh, expeditions. I help them figure out where are they going to go, what time, how are they going to get on shore, what kind of electricity will they need, so forth, all the way through to vetting the narrative of the story, what, what images, what video do they want, to quality fact checking the, the final production to, to the very last bit. So, you know, I love working with media companies um, over that whole arc so I can help them tell the story that they want to tell and make sure that it's factual and that it it's not distorting the science in some way that would, I think, not be true to the, to the data. And, and at the end of the day, we want to get the, the right message out there and make sure that, um, uh, and sometimes that's not the easiest message to tell, you know, and it might require that, you know, we communicate some of the uncertainties that we do have about exactly what's going on and, um, you know, how populations might change in the future. Absolutely. And it's not just about the results that you're sharing, but also a lot of the techniques and the methods. For example, you know, you first employed um, satellite imagery for insects and then creatively transferred that to penguins. So is there a possibility that this is the same type, the same type of outlook can be used on other populations and other studies? Have you seen that happen before? Um, maybe even inanimate objects in space. So why is it, I, I guess I'm, my question is, you know, are you seeing the methods being communicate as well, not just the results. Absolutely, and the methods speak for themselves because I think when people see what's possible, uh, the wheels start turning. So, you know, anything bigger than a piece of paper, you know, we can see from satellite imagery because the resolution of the imagery that we have now is 31 centimeters, which is, you know, probably smaller than everyone's, uh, you know, monitor right now. And so we can study, uh, just in the Antarctic, we're looking at penguins, uh, seals, we can see whales under the surface of the ocean. You can study, you know, walruses and polar bears and gazelles and elephants. I mean, just imagine all of the animals on the planet that we can now study using satellite imagery. And so, you know, the idea that we will actually soon know where all the large animals on the planet are and where they're not and where their populations are moving, it's like, it's like, wow, you know, you know, I'd like to say that until recently, I think a lot of wildlife biology would look pretty familiar to Darwin. I mean, that's crazy considering all the advances that we've had in other areas of biology. You think CRISPR and, and genomics and all these other things. But satellites, I think, are one of these game-changing technologies that will allow ecology to kind of leap from, you know, the 19th century right into the 21st and 22nd century. So I'm really excited about kind of helping move ecology forward in that way. Absolutely. And when you say, you know, you study penguins, I immediately imagine your day to be out in the field on a regular basis, <laughs> interacting with animals, rolling in snow. You know, what is this true? You know, what percentage of your time is actually out in the field as compared to labs or other environments and experiments? Sure. So it's in a big mix. So uh, I have a 10 year old daughter. And before I had my daughter, I was in the field that that last field season. Uh, before I had my daughter uh, four months that year. So very long field seasons, a lot of time out, um, rolling around in the snow as it were. Um, now, you know, if I'm gone three weeks, I feel super guilty and my own, uh, my own field work is jammed between the fall and spring semesters at my university. Um, so it's a team effort. I've got a, a large number of graduate students that kind of do those two, three, four month stints that I used to be able to do. Um, but most of the day is like everyone else's um, kind of doing battle with your inbox and trying to um, keep on top of the science. And, you know, in, a, in a, a best case scenario day for me is that I get to write some computer code and I get to do some modeling and I, you know, maybe spend some hours staring at satellite imagery. And, you know, that that for me is like pure bliss because that's, you know, that's the kind of discovery process that I love. So. Um, 
you know, a, a surprising amount of my time is spent staring at satellite imagery. I have to do that with the lights out. So it's like 100% dark in the room and I sit there in my cave and I just, I'm just staring at the, the imagery one after the other and you kind of time sort of, you're kind of lost to time, hours go by. So you can kind of really get into it. Um, and I would encourage people to sort of fly around in Google Earth and, and explore the Antarctic that way. Cause it really, it's an amazing, it's amazing, uh, uh, perspective on a continent that that most people will never have the chance to go to. Oh, I, I hope I have the chance to go there one day, but maybe I'll just end up being one of your students in the near future. No, we <laughs> well, you'd be surprised, you know, that, you know, maybe not this year, um, but uh, in general, about 60 to 70,000 people go to Antarctica on vacation every year. So um, there certainly are opportunities uh, to, to go on vacation or if, if people want to uh, turn it into a career. So they've got lots of options. Very neat. And I think when I listen to inspirational leaders like yourself, it's, you know, it's difficult to imagine that there wasn't a time where you weren't doing this work, that there wasn't a time in your life where your only goal was to get to Antarctica <laughs> and study penguins. You know, did you ever have moments of uncertainty? What was it like moving away from physics into an entirely new subject area that you weren't even sure you liked or not? And who yeah. kind of helped you along the way? What was that transition? Sure. No, that that was really difficult. I think you know uh, physicists like to think of themselves as the uh, the top of the, the the food chain. They just sort of have that that attitude. So it's very hard to leave. It's like um, uh, you feel like a fallen angel, you know. That, you, but they. Uh, so the idea that I would go from studying uh, experimental physics to studying at the time insect outbreaks was about as you know about 180 degrees as you could go. Um, but for me, that, that common language was mathematics. And so the fact that I always loved math, um, that, was, that was the currency, I think, that allowed me to um, transition between these different fields um, relatively easily. Um, but it was, it was very difficult. I was lucky to find a PhD advisor who was open to accepting someone from physics, a complete unknown, like it was a real leap of faith to take me on as a, as a student. Um, and have subsequently had a number of really terrific advisors and mentors who continue to help every day. So I still keep in touch with many of my former mentors. Um, you're, you're never too senior in your career to need advice. You always need advice from people that have been there before. So, um, you know, I do encourage students to, um, you know, find those mentors in their life that they can stay in touch with over the years. And um, you know, you don't know until you know. So having someone to ask along the way has been critical. Absolutely. And, and, and along your entire career journey, I'm sure you faced a fair share of challenges and obstacles, both physically as you were actually scaling those mountains in the pictures <laughs> that you've shown us, but also institutionally and, and mentally. You know, can you sure. think of some of those moments that you know, were really challenging for you, whether that be you know, as a woman in the field of STEM or going into a really unknown environment and exploring that, what were some of the hindrances you experienced? You know, it, it, it has been tough. I remember in particular, there were some, um, there were some cases early on in my career where I would, um, there was a fair amount of sexism. I think not, uh, in, not from uh, colleagues that I knew, but when you send your papers out for peer review, you're relying on the sort of unbiased assessment of your, your peers. And I think that's where, unfortunately, a lot of uh, bias does come into the, the academic process. And so, uh, for example, I had uh, one incident in particular where I had gotten a series of reviews that um, my postdoc advisor said, you know, I, I've never gotten reviews like that. Like just the tone, uh, uh, the, you know, was, was not constructive. And so I started uh, submitting my uh, papers under just my initials. So just my initials and my last name. And the reviews that I started getting back on my papers were much more positive. Papers were accepted more easily, much more constructive. And it was like eye-opening. It was like, wow, like this is what it's like to be a man. <laughs> I mean, or at least like on paper to sort of pass. Um, and I still, I still submit my papers that way. So I think that there have been some, some tricks and actually what made me think to do that was I looked at a lot of the senior female ecologists that I really respected in my own field. Um, even in within the penguin world, and they went by their first initials. And I thought, oh, like maybe that's not a coincidence. Like maybe, maybe I should try that, you know, and it really works. So it's just funny. Um, sometimes you, you find these runarounds to, uh, to level the playing field for yourself. Um, and then certainly, you know, being a mom and, and being an Antarctic scientist, you know, has been a difficult challenge. Um, 
you know, uh, just the, the travel associated with research and international research, not just going to Antarctica, but going to international meetings, going to the treaty meetings, you know, I might be traveling three or four months out of every year. And, and so juggling that um, has been has been a challenge. But, um, you know, we've, we've, we've managed so far. And again, like I said, um, you know, there have been periods in my life before where I could go on a long expedition and those times will happen again in the future. And, um, you know, in terms of taking the long view of one's career, I think on average, it's very possible to kind of balance all of those different hats that you might want to wear throughout your life. So. No, absolutely. And, and, and good advice there. I'd also like to take this time to ask questions from the audience. We have members joining us from India, from Mauritius, Bolivia, Mexico, Peru, the US, and within there from Puerto Rico, New York City, California. So we're just going to hop right in with a lot of the questions awesome. that are coming in. One that's been asked from Sanjit from India is how do you get access to the satellite images that you use in your research? What does that process look like? Sure. So uh, the, you know, about a lot of our logistics work can actually be done just in Google Earth, you know, and that imagery is about two meter resolution imagery. Um, all of the other sub meter resolution imagery either has to be purchased from Maxar, which used to be Digital Globe, or it can be um, licensed sometimes as part of a, of, a, of a grant. If we have a grant from the National Science Foundation, that might give us access to imagery. Um, but imagery is... Um, it's, it's the sort of the keystone of our scientific enterprise. And so um, it, it, you know, the, the question is a good one, you know, is that we, we wanna make sure to, to have that kind of access. Although people at home, I would say that what ends up in Google Earth or in Bing or some of the other mapping software is, is, is excellent quality and often good enough for the kind of science that we do. Wonderful, and this is a popular question, we've been asked it more than once, but I'm sure that you get a lot of support from the scientific community, from others that are also doing this work, um, but how have you dealt with or have you experienced any setback in a lot of your work or people that are actively not wanting to protect um, some of these islands that you've identified and how do you deal with confrontation like that? Yeah, so I would say that um, the Antarctic has traditionally been pretty um, territorial. Um, so it used to be that, you know, Antarctica is, at least on paper, sort of divided into these little territorial wedges. And I think actually scientifically it's been divided that way as well. And so being able to see all of Antarctica with satellite imagery, I think, has uh, ruffled a few feathers over the years because there are, it's now possible for one person or one research group to study all of Antarctica. And so sometimes that... Um, makes people feel defensive, you know, it's like, those are my penguins. Um, so there's been a little pushback there. Um, but I think the most challenging issue that we face is that we're trying to collaborate with NGOs like Greenpeace, for example, and the Antarctic tour operators, um, uh, industry trade group and the Antarctic treaty parties and a number of different constituencies, the, the krill uh, catch company. So a lot of different constituencies that want different things from the Antarctic and have different ideas about how the Antarctic should be protected. And so you don't want, you want to be kind of a neutral arbiter. You want to be able to work with the krill fishing companies and the tour operators and the conservation NGOs all at the same time and not, um, and not get uh, sort of sucked into, into some of the politics that can be so um, divisive in the Antarctic. Absolutely. And maybe a bit more of a lighthearted question. You know, Manola from California and so many others have been asking, what has been the cutest animal that you've seen and how many cute animals are you going to interact with? So I will say, you know, my most um, amazing moment in the Antarctic ever was once it was Thanksgiving Day, uh, which is already sort of a, a great day. And we went to, we, we just by some miracle, and actually this was on a National Geographic ship, we were able to pull into a place called Snow Hill Island, which is an emperor penguin colony. And we were able to park the ship in the sea ice, get out onto the ice, and actually mingle with the emperor penguins. And, you know, I had never really seen emperor penguins up close. I don't, I don't study them except possibly by satellite. Um, but to actually be on the ice, surrounded by emperor penguins um, on a day that actually was a, it was almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was, it was warm. It was like t-shirt weather warm. Um, it, and it, it was just an amazing day. And I think emperor penguins really take the cake. Um, you know, I, 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 I wish I had the chance to study them more closely in the field, but, um, but I don't, but it was a real treat to see them up close just that once. That was 
11 years ago. Um, and I still, I still think about that as being sort of my top highlight. Oh, that is wonderful to hear. Um, and I know you have some great pieces of advice to us earlier in your presentation, but as of right now, what's one way that we can all be involved right from home? Is there something that me or my audience that's watching from home can do immediately once they shut off their laptops? Sure. So there's a, so a couple of things that I would I would suggest. So one is to go to penguinmap.com and you can be a penguin detective and you can, you can help us find uh, penguins. So what we've done is we've put these KMZ files that you can literally just drag and drop into Google Earth and it shows you where all the known penguin colonies are. And so if you find one that's not on our list, you, you've discovered it and there's an email address to tell me about it and we'll, we'll dig into it further. And the other is through Zooniverse. It's a project called Penguin Watch that we uh, collaborate with, uh, led out of the University of Oxford in the UK. And so you can help us annotate uh, camera trap imagery of penguin colonies. And we use that imagery to answer all sorts of scientific questions, but there's just too much imagery for us to go through. There's millions and millions of these camera images. So you guys at home can help us mark out where all the adults are and where the eggs are and, and help us um, do some really great science that way as well. Well, I know what I'm doing after this session. Um, and I want to ask one final question is thinking back on your teenage years, Heather, you know, what advice would you give to your past self in retrospect? And is there anything that you would have done differently knowing what you know today? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, like, I, like my initial reaction is that I would want to tell my teenage self not to, to worry so much, um, you know, but but on the other hand, I think that that worrying so much has probably been, um, you know, an important part of, of my my success. You know, to the extent that that I have been successful, I think is because I do worry a lot, and um, and so it would be it would be I don't know I I, I maybe I wouldn't want to um, worry worry less, but uh, I do think that um, again, kind of getting back to this idea that that you're you're in there for the long game, and I think a lot of people see dead ends or mistakes or things that don't go quite as you want. I mean, it's all a learning experience. So, you know, we've done things in the field that just totally didn't work, you know, but we learned a lot doing that. And I think it, I think it's okay to walk away from an experience and be like, man, that was a disaster, but I learned a lot and I won't do that again. And, um, and not to worry so much about what seem like failures. Cause they're all, they're all learning opportunities. Wonderful. And, you know, what does the future of your work look like right now with the pandemic? Um, and what's the best way to stay informed about what you're doing after the end of the session? Sure. So, you know, we are, you know, we're not probably going into the field this year. I think getting on an Antarctic cruise ship right now seems pretty unlikely, um, but it it's a silver lining. Of, we've had some really big expeditions over the last few years. And um, there, there are data sets sort of piling up on drives that we'll have a chance to dig through and finally start to catalog and count a lot of the drone imagery that we've collected. So the silver lining of having a, a year where we're not in the field is that we'll probably start to um, dig through the backlog a bit. Um, but the, the best way to keep in touch with us, we do, um, you, can, you can see it uh, there on the screen. You know, we are on Twitter at, at the Lynch Lab um, and we, we have a blog and um, it's uh, lynchlab.com. So people can, you know, kind of see what we're up to there. And um, yeah, and we, we, we keep that pretty up to date. So new papers or anything exciting, um, other, other media events or stories, we post it there and, and people can keep in touch uh, as, as the discoveries you know, kind of roll on. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll continue to have some new ones as we dig through our, dig through all our hard drives. Well, I'm excited to keep updated on all the awesome work that you guys are doing, Heather. Thank you so, so much for your time um, and for being so gracious to chat with us today. It's been really fruitful. Oh, it was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Oh, and thank you again to everyone that's watching. So please continue sharing your thoughts by tagging at Nat Geo Education or using hashtag GenGeo on social media. And if you're available this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, I'm gonna add on to the things that you can do right from home to be involved. You can join PhotoCamp live sessions with National Geographic Explorers and photographers, Lynn Johnson and Hannah Rise Morales as they discuss the power of photography to explore topics of resilience and of empathy and love and hope. So if you're inspired by Heather's talk today, I can think of no better way to continue your learning journey. Um, and as the summer series comes to a close, I do want to take the time to share a quick story with you. 
So National Geographic is really passionate about the belief of the power of young people. But did you know this? This passion can be tracked all the way back to the founding of the organization about 132 years ago. In 1888, 33 explorers and scientists decided to meet up to create an organization that would increase and share geographic knowledge. What many people don't know, however, is that of these 33 innovators, six, six of them were under the age of 30. They're young people, they're visionaries, no different from you and I, who helped National Geographic's foundings. They didn't stand idly by waiting for their turn. They challenged the notion that young people are not just the future. We are very much part of the present. So as I reflect on this moment more than a century later, you know, much has changed. But one aspect that I think remains the same is that we continue to encounter and overcome obstacles. And what's clear to me is that our world today is facing an unprecedented amount of challenges. You have a global pandemic, an ongoing fight for racial equity, a climate emergency, a refugee crisis, just to name a few. And while all of these challenges take different forms, a lot of them require the same passion, creativity, and urgency that you, young people, are bringing to the table. In closing, you know, I want to take the time to find a, a, to share a finding from the Institute of Future, which found that up to 85% of jobs of today's college students will have in 10 years, they haven't even been invented yet. So that's to say that ingenuity, imagination, flexibility in pursuing our passions, they ought to be at the forefront of our educational understanding. So please continue to connect with us on social media, on all of our platforms, follow at NatGeo education platforms, use the hashtag GenGeo, keep learning and keep staying curious. Thank you again for joining me this summer and we can't wait to connect with you again. That GenGeo conversations have taught me is that working towards solving a problem is more critical than pursuing a specific career. So thank you to everyone. Embrace the unknown. There's still so much room to grow your passions and explore uncharted territory. Take care.